Well, welcome everyone and thank you for attending this webinar, which is part of our Erwin Mitchell International Series Injury Teams Virtual Trek Across Europe series, where, as the name suggests, we're virtually trekking across different EU member states. At each stop, we'll take a look at the relevant laws of that country insofar as those laws are relevant to cross-border PI claims. Our virtual trek today takes us to the glorious Espana, and where else would we rather be on a dingy Friday in England? So let's all imagine that we're sitting by the beach with the sun shining on us and we've got a sangria in hand. I'm Jennifer Lund, I'm a partner in Owen Mitchell's London International Series Injury Team and my work focuses around supporting people who've sustained catastrophic injuries or families whose lives have been affected by fatalities abroad. I'm a Spanish speaker, so naturally I have a, Spanish in, uh, a special interest in cases um, involving all elements of Spanish law. I'm joined by Gemma Richardson, who is a chartered legal exec at IM, and she has several years experience in international travel litigation. And not to embarrass her, but she's very quickly becoming a bit of a pro in the field of international serious injury, and in particular, in complex Spanish cross-border claims. Sorry, Gemma. Now, Gemma and I are extremely lucky to be joined by the exceptionally knowledgeable Professor Dr. Mikel Martin Casals. Mikel, as we like to call him, is not only a professor of civil law at the University of Girona, but he was also the chairperson of a joint ministerial commission of the Ministry of Economy and the Ministry of Justice in Spain, which prepared the draft bill on the act incorporating the Baremo. So for those of you who aren't aware, and I think most of you are, uh, the Borema is a scale or a table system used to calculate damages to be awarded to victims of road traffic accidents in Spain. And the Act incorporating the Borema regulates Spanish civil liability and insurance matters in Spanish road traffic accidents. The Borema has been around for quite a while now, but the new Borema entered into force in Spain on the 1st of January 2016 after approval by Spanish Parliament. Now, Miquel is now acting as the chairperson of both the legal working team and the ex post evaluation team of the follow up commission for the Borema in Spain. Both were established by the Spanish Ministry of Economy and the Spanish Ministry of Justice. So it follows that what Mikel doesn't know about the Borema really isn't worth knowing. In today's discussion, <clears throat> we'll explore the applicable Spanish law relevant to cross border claims, which can be brought in England or Wales following an accident in Spain. And we'll use a fictional case study as a point of reference throughout the webinar. But because of the limited time that we do have, we won't be able to look at package travel or product liability claims today, but perhaps we can do that another day. Just a few housekeeping points before we start, if I may. If you want to ask a question, and we have had quite a few already, could I just ask that you submit your question using the question and answer message functionality? If your connection drops or you're logged out of the discussion, then please just, just dial back in. Um, we'll be recording this session and making notes that we'll have a webinar to refer back to. And we'll look to close the webinar in about 60 to 75 minutes. So we'll be keeping a close eye on the time just to ensure that we get through all of the key points. And finally, please do complete the feedback link, which is going to be sent around towards the end of the webinar. So uh, without further ado, to kick off, Gemma is going to take us through our fictional case study. So on to the next slide and over to you, Gemma. Thanks, Jennifer. OK, so Sarah and Rachel Jones are an English couple um, and they're on holiday in Barcelona in January 2017. Now, on the 5th of January, they were involved in an accident. Rachel and Sarah have got two young children and Rachel was also 30 weeks pregnant at the time. Now, as they were walking back to their hotel one evening, Rachel was run over by a car which mounted the curb. The car was driven by a Spanish national and it was insured by a Spanish insurance company. Can we have the next slide, please? The police attended the scene of the accident and Rachel was taken to hospital. Luckily, Sarah managed to escape without injury, um, but sadly, Rachel sustained a catastrophic head injury and she also lost her unborn child. Shortly after, she was repatriated to the UK. The next slide, please. Now, Rachel was eventually discharged from her neuro rehab unit on the 8th of August 2019. Sadly, she's never going to live an independent life again. Sarah is now left to provide all care for Rachel and for their young children. 
Prior to the accident, Rachel was working as a lawyer and she worked three days a week. She spent the other four days a week looking after the home and the children. Sadly, she's never going to be able to work in any form of paid or unemployed, uh, paid unemployment again. Can we have the next slide, please? And Jennifer, could you tell us a little bit about limitation in Sarah and Rachel's case? I can. Um, so we know that Spanish law allows for a direct right of action against a sp Spanish multi-liability insurer here. And we do know that Sarah and Rachel can bring their claim in England following Regulation 44 2001 and the case of Odenbright. So although their claim will be brought in England, we know that Spanish law will apply to uh, the claim and in particular to limitation. So limitation period for personal injury under Spanish law is either one year from the date of the accident, one year from the consolidation of the injuries and we'll hear a few times about consolidation throughout this uh, webinar but um, this is the point at which the claimant cannot recover any further from their injuries. Alternatively it's one year from when the Spanish, Spanish criminal file was archived assuming uh, that a criminal file was opened but we would expect in a case of this severity that one would have been opened. So this would mean to be on the safe side, uh, Sarah and Rachel should assume that they've got one year from the date of the accident to take any action in any claim. So until the 4th of January 2018. Now this period can be extended or interrupted every year until the claim is settled or until proceedings are issued at court. Now I'm not going to go into great length here about uh, the process for interruption, not least because I've seen a couple of very good webinars out there which talk about limitation periods. Um, so they were great. But Parties usually interrupt limitation by way of a document known as uh, a Bureau Fax, which is a legally recognised certified letter sent to defendants. So let's imagine for a moment that Sarah and Rachel's accident happened before the new Boremo came into force, so i.e. before 31st of December 2015. Now we're going to move on to Mikkel, who's going to tell us a little bit about what the law was in place in Spain before the new Boremo. So Gigi, if you could put us onto the next slide and then over to you, Mikhail. Well, as Jennifer has said, the Boremo has been around for some time, but not, not for so many years, you know. So in this timeline of the Boremo, we'll see that uh, before 1991, there were no standards for uh, traffic injury uh, accidents uh, uh, damages. Uh, so uh, the the difference were quite uh, um, quite important between the different provincial courts in the case of non pecuniary losses, and and that gave rise to a very strong dissatisfaction by lawyers. So in 1991 they tried to introduce for the first time a sort of baremo, but it was not mandatory. Uh, what happened afterwards is that some insurers captured the legislator and imposed the legislator a system which was the old Baremo, the old Baremo system, which was made mandatory in an act in uh, 1995. At the beginning, there was a very strong reaction against the Baremo. Some courts refused to apply the Baremo. Even the Supreme Court refused to apply, apply the, the Baremo as a mandatory scheme. Even some people complained and brought the case before the Constitutional Court and in a decision of the Constitutional Court, the, the court said that except for a few small aspects, the Veremo was not against the Constitution. So what happened afterwards? People who refused the Veremo started to apply the Veremo to everything, even to uh, outside road, tra road traffic accidents, you know. Uh, that led that there were minor am amendments. So, for instance, in 2003, there was the amendment uh, about aesthetical damage. Uh, in 2007, dealing with a, a law that had nothing to do with the Baremo, it was introduced this uh, 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 exception that no future uh, medical expenses would be paid, which was, was one of the topics that Gemma is going to talk us about later on in the Scales case, you know. So what happened? Uh, uh, in 2010, the Spanish Supreme Court started saying that is enough is enough as and I start to try and find ways how to uh, make the Baremo more flexible. The insurance sector reacted and said, well, we have to do something. 
So they close themselves uh, in a, a absolute secrecy and they try to produce a new Baremo. But well, the country had changed that. The victims had associated themselves and the associations of victims reacted and said, well, this is not possible. You cannot just do that yourself on your own. So they produce a counter Baremo and then the government said, all right, we'll have to establish a sort of commission that all where all the stakeholders are represented and they are going to discuss the Baremo. So that was it was done in 2010. In 2010, it was a, 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 it was set up a, a, a official experts commission. This experts commission uh, was working from 2010 and 2014. Uh, uh, that explains a lot of things of the Baremo because all these stakeholders were present and the Baremo, uh, we'll see later on, it's just uh, the new one is a, is a, is a first step. And uh, uh, the Baremo was, and the new one entered into force in January 2016. You know, uh, for, uh, over these these few years, we have been following up in a follow-up commission of the Baremo to see uh, the problems that the the, the new Baremo uh, uh, presented. You know. And some of the problems were to be expected because uh, the new Baremo is very different from the old one. There are many new ideas, new heads of laws and all that. And in this follow up commission, we had uh, a commission of good practices guide. So uh, the Baremo now must be read sometimes together with this guide of good practice because it gives some interpretations that courts uh, even follow them. You know, they, they recommend it sometimes. And then we establish an ex post evaluation commission. This ex post evaluation commission uh, produced a report uh, last July, and the report uh, has uh, 50 recommendations for improvement of the Baremo. And then we'll see what happens. But the Baremo, the Baremo is a, a living thing, you know, because uh, it's uh, it's uh, improving itself all the time. So uh, I'm going to speak a little bit now. Um, so, as Mikhail touched upon, um, technically the brain was being developed for application in road traffic accidents in Spain, but because of um, the use of the Borema in other cases, effectively the Spanish courts have started to recognise that it can be it can be applied in non road traffic accidents as well. And in fact, parties in other personal injury actions in Spain do tend to value claims now by reference to the Borema. And and let me say a few words, a few words about it, Jennifer. You Absolutely, know, please do. Yeah, the, 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 the Baremo is applied uh, as a sort of orientation, as a sort of guideline to situations outside road traffic liability. In, a, in road traffic liability is compulsory, in the other, in the other uh, uh, cases is not compulsory. In the old Baremo, it used to be said that it had to be applied in full. Uh, I mean, courts had the opportunity and, and defendants and claimants had the opportunity to invoke the Baremo, but they could not pick and choose. They could not get the, 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 the best what they wanted. If they used the Baremo's orientation, they had to use it as a whole, you know. Well, I have doubts that this should be the same again, and we're looking for, for case law about it, you know, but this is very important. And just to finish, now they are discussing a new Baremo, a different one, for medical uh, uh, mishaps and medical mal malpractice, you know. Uh, they try to do one against in secrecy and all that. I hope that this is a failure, you know, because one country cannot afford to have so many baremos for the different uh, areas of activity, you know. And actually, this baremo was meant to be cheaper, cheaper, because when you when you suffer an accident, uh, you are uh, uh, completely whole. But when you go to the doctor, you are already sick and, and your accident is worth nonsense. I hope it does not cope. Well, there we go. That's. Uh... That's a subject for a, a completely different webinar, which we can possibly bring to you in about six months. We'll see. Um, but listen, no discussion about the old Baremo would be complete without mentioning the uh, case of scales and MIB, which we've talked about a little earlier. And it was handled by our very own James Riley, who's a fantastic lawyer based in our Birmingham office. Um, but he can't be um, with us uh, today, unfortunately. So Gemma, can you tell us a little bit about that case and its importance? Gigi, could you move to the next slide, please? I'd be delighted to. Um, now, by way of background, in October 2015, Mr Scales was on holiday and he was with a group of friends cycling on the Camino de La Hoya in Almira. Excuse my pronunciation. 
Uh, now, he was cycling close to the villa that he shared with his wife um, and he was knocked off of his bike by a car which was being driven on the wrong side of the road. Unfortunately, the driver of the car didn't stop at the scene. Now, Mr Scales was quite badly injured and he was airlifted to hospital in Spain. He spent several weeks in a coma. He was repatriated back to the UK by air. Mr Scales was 69 years old at the time of the accident and he was in excellent physical health and fitness. But he suffered some really serious injuries in the accident, including a traumatic brain injury, facial fractures, sight and hearing problems, dental injuries and a fractured left tibia. Mr Scales has been left with limited mobility, restrictions to his sight and mild cognitive difficulties. And all of this means that he requires constant supervision from his wife. This is not the retirement that they'd hoped for. Now, the driver of the car that hit Mr Scales was traced and it was established that she was uninsured. Now, because Mr Scales is domiciled in England, his claim was brought against the MIB and the MIB effectively step into the shoes of the Consorcio, which is a Spanish guarantee fund. Liability was resolved in April 2018 at a liability trial and the judge found 100% in Mr Scales' favour. Now the MIB were only liable to pay to Mr Scales what the Spanish Guarantee Fund would have to pay to him had his claim been brought in Spain. Now because this accident happened in 2015, it fell in the scope of the old Baremo and a quantum trial took place in May this year, one of the first remote trials, and this took place at the High Court. Can we have the next uh, slide please? Now there were five really interesting points in scales which I'm going to take you through. The first was whether or not there was flexibility under the old Baremo in awarding damages or if the provision for closed and limited categories of loss had to be strictly applied by the court. The second was what the correct consolidation date would be and the points to be awarded for the permanent sequelae. The date at which the victim's injuries reach a point or plateau or stabilisation is what we mean when we talk about consolidation. Uh, it's something Jennifer touched on earlier. Uh, the next question was whether Mr Scales was deemed to be a grand invalido. Fourth, we're going to look at whether Mr Scales is permanent incapacity and what level that was um, assessed to be at. And finally, we will look at whether penalty interest was awarded by the court. Now, on the first point, the court found that Spanish experts um, called to court by the parties gave two diametrically opposed views. And the court found that the old Baremo had very strict limitations. It was extremely ungenerous to claimants, often resulting in undercompensation. And it was completely at odds with the Spanish principle of restituto in integrum. The court found that it had, there were glaring omissions in the old Baremo, which meant that medical, pharmaceutical and hospital costs were not allowed after consolidation. However, the court found that they must assess damages in the same way that a Spanish court would, even if it was difficult. The courts cannot default to English law. Can we have the next slide, please? Now, using its discretion, the English court found that Mr Scales' consolidation date was October 2017 not April 2017, as the defendant had tried to argue. This meant he was able to recover a higher proportion of his pre-consolidation expenses. And that's quite important, as we've just said, the Aremo limited post-consolidation expenses. Now, there was a dispute in scales whether or not Mr Scales would be classed as a grand invalido. And this is the most serious level of disability recognised under the old Aremo. Now, the expression is defined in Table 4 of the old Aremo, and it applies to victims with permanent sequelae that require the help of other people to carry out the most essential daily activities, such as dressing, traveling, eating or similar. So this might apply to um, a patient with tetraplegia, paraplegia, states of chronic coma, vegetative coma, or neurological, neurophysiological injuries, and those with severe mental or physical disorders. Now, in this case, the court found that Mr Scales wasn't grand invalido. And this meant there were a lot of damages he wasn't able to recover. For example, past and future gratuitous care and assistance, which had kindly been provided by his wife, and that would have been paid by way of a moral damages award for his relatives. We're going to talk about that later. Uh, damages for future personal care and support and any accommodation or vehicle adaption costs. We have the next slide, please. 
Now, the, one of the questions the court needed to address was the level of permanent incapacity. And there are three levels of permanent capacity, and this is entirely at the court's discretion, which level they find a claimant to fall under. And you'll see from the figures on your screen that this can have quite the impact on the level of damages awarded. This award is sometimes referred to as a corrective award, and it is entirely separate from a finding of grand invalidos. In this case, thankfully, the court exercised its discretion and Mr Scales was deemed to be of absolute permanent incapacity. Now, this is defined, defined as someone with sequelae that prevent the disabled individual from carrying out any occupation or activity. And the court recognised in this case that whilst Mr Scales was retired and therefore it wouldn't impact his ability to work, prior to the accident, he'd been extremely fit and healthy, very, very active and some very sporty hobbies. He was now left essentially trapped in his own home. He couldn't walk for longer than 45 minutes. He can't pursue his hobbies of cycling. He can't drive. He can't be intimate with his wife and he's limited in what he can do around the house. And sadly, he's also lost all of his confidence. Now, in this case, the judge exercised his discretion and he awarded Mr Scales the maximum sum available in this category, which is the €191,151.88. Now, the other point of importance in Scales was about penalty interest, and Jennifer is very excited to tell you about this. Gigi, can we have the next slide? And I'll hand over to Jennifer. Thank you. I am very excited about this, so judge me as you will. Um, I'm going to talk about um, penalty interest, um, and this is something that falls outside the scope of the um, Boremo altogether. So we'll park uh, what Gemma said about the old Boremo and scales for now. But the final point of importance in scale was the imposition of penalty interest. Um, the entitlement to this interest is found in Spanish law in the Insurance Contract Act of the 8th of October 1980. Um, I think there's a whole dispute going on in Spain right now about the Insurance Contract Act, but we will come on to that possibly in another webinar. But going back uh, to Scales, the judge in Scales considered that the existence of a right to claim interest was a matter for the lex causae, and that is the law of a place where the accident happened, so Spanish law. However, the English court has a discretionary power to award interest and to decide the amount of interest so it didn't really matter whether the judge proceeded under the lex causae or under his discretion, because he said that he would exercise the, his discretion in line with Spanish law in any event. Now, under Spanish law, the Insurance Contract Act provides for punitive rates of interest or penalty interest. So for the first two years after the accident, at the rate of legal interest in Spain, which is fixed by the Bank of Spain, and it's currently 3%, plus a further 50% of that amount on top, so a further 1.5%. And that provides a total penalty interest rate of 4.5% for the first two years after the accident. Now, after this is when it gets interesting, because after that date, after those two years, a statutory amount of 20% penalty interest will apply. And that's a high amount, and that will have a huge impact on, on the value of any damages. Now, my understanding for the reason um, to impose penalty interest under Spanish law is largely to encourage parties to settle their claims as early as they possibly can, but ideally within the two, first two years. Where an insurer hasn't settled a claim within two years of the accident, they can potentially avoid paying penalty interest if they can show that there is what is referred to as a justified delay for the non-settlement. The evidence in scales was that the Spanish courts interpret this exception in a very restrictive manner, with legitimate exceptions being, for example, whether some reason to doubt that the claim was covered by the relevant insurance policy or an issue as to whether the insured had paid the premiums. So in scales, it, would, it was held that it'd be very rare for a dispute regarding liability or quantum to actually engage that escape clause. So the fact that the English CPR, the Civil Procedure Rules, has its own system for encouraging the resolution of disputes under Part 36, or that the defendant was the English MIB, or that there was no court appointed forensic medical examiner in scales, they were all held not to be good reasons in the court's view to deprive a claimant of the entitlement to penalty interest. So you'll appreciate that this finding had a very significant impact on the assessment of damages in scales because penalty interest added approximately 180,000 euros onto the judgment sum, which 
which bumped the total damages award up to 539,000. This meant, imposing this penalty interest thus meant that Mr Scales beat his own Part 36 offer and uh, because of that he received damages uplift permitted under the Part 36 regime. Now, another point that I think is particularly interested about penalty interest is that defendants will often try to argue, Spanish insurer defence will often try to argue, but the date for the commencement of a running of legal interest is instead, not the date of the accident, but it's the DS quo, the date of the knowledge of a claim. And it's a topic that's often discussed in um, legal academic circles in Spain, but the prevailing legal opinion I'm told by Mikhail, uh, considers that the date legal interest starts running is the date of the accident and not the date of knowledge of a claim. And if you think about this practically, in reality, there should be very little time between the two dates because we know that in Spain, that insurers have a duty to investigate the existence of accidents. And they're usually contacted by police or hospitals um, as soon as the accident happens or very soon after directly to put them on notice that the accident has happened, not least because Spanish hospitals expect insurers to meet those hospital costs, liable insurers, I would add. Now, that's probably enough about uh, penalty interest for today. So let's move on to the new Baremo, which applies, as we've said a few, <laughs> a few times now, to all road traffic accidents in Spain after the 1st of January 2016. And I'm going to hand over to Mikel. So Mikel, what can you tell us about the new Boremo and why it came about? Gigi, could you move us on to the next slide and move over to Mikel? Thank you, Jennifer. Well, the dividing line with the new Boremo is the same one that with the old one. The dividing line uh, uh, between the uh, situations in case of personal injury is consolidation or stabilization of the injury. So in the whole system is not organized according to past or future losses, but according to temporary or permanent injuries. So temporary injuries are those that the victim suffers between the moment of the accident and full recovery or stabilization of the injuries. When the injuries is stabilized, then they become permanent injuries or sequelae. Injuries that cannot be healed, that the medical treatment cannot improve the condition of the victim, these are uh, these sequelae or permanent injuries. So if you look at the organization of the system, the new Baremo system, uh, 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 it's also the organization of the tables. We have three uh, possible sorts of injuries. The first one that we call death, uh, you would probably call it fatal injuries. We're not going to deal with them today. Probably that would be the matter of another webinar if someone were interested, you know. Uh, uh, then this is, these are number one in the tables. Permanent injuries are number two in the tables and temporary injuries are number three in the tables. Then in each case, we have what we call basic non-pecuniary laws, which is the same for everybody. Specific non-pecuniary losses, these are uh, 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 losses that arise in a specific situations. These are still non-pecuniary losses. And then we have pecuniary losses where we distinguish between uh, uh, positive damage or expenses and loss of earnings. So uh, if you uh, have a problem, for instance, a permanent injury and regarding pecuniary losses in case of permanent injury, you'll have to look in tables to see. You know, it's a case of fatal injury, a basic uh, 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 non pecuniary loss in case of a fatal injury, you should go to table 1A and so on. You know, this is the basic idea of how uh, the, the, the system, the system functions, you know. Um, thank you. Thank you for that, Mikel. And just um, for those of you who aren't aware, and I, yeah, there we go, I'm on the screen. <laughs> So um, most of you will know what um, non-pecuniary losses are and what pecuniary losses are, but just to make this absolutely clear for those of you who, who aren't aware, pecuniary losses are the what we refer to in England as the uh, special damages, usually the financial losses and expenses, whereas non-pecuniary losses are more the general damages, the injury focused losses. Um, so as Mikhail said, we're not going to talk about fatal claims today. Uh, we, we just don't have enough time to do that in this webinar. So we, again, perhaps we can do that another time. Uh, let's instead focus on our case study of Rachel and Sarah with Rachel having sustained her catastrophic head injury. Um, now, there's been a lot um, 
out recently about um, the role of foreign um, medical experts in English cases. Um, an interesting uh, case was referred to recently um, in an article I read. Um, but I would like to look at what the role is of Spanish medical legal experts under the Brema. Um, so I'm going to turn to Mikel on that point. So if Gigi, you could take us over to the next slide. Well, actually, uh, medical experts uh, work in a very different uh, way, you know. So the Spanish system follows the point system that is followed by other countries like Belgium, France, uh, Italy and so on, you know. So uh, uh, the, the, the medical expert, to some extent, he's a king in the system, you know, because the medical expert does not describe the injury, but assesses a certain point, gives uh, a certain po a number of points to each injury. You know, and the number of points still with the new Baremo is important because sometimes if you don't have enough points, you cannot uh, uh, get a, 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 a certain uh, head of loss, you know. So uh, uh, the, the medical expert will assess the severity of the injury in the case of a psychophysical injury, as we're going to see later on, uh, in a scale that goes from zero to 100. And then uh, separately, he will assess static damage, uh, which is also assessing points with other criteria uh, from uh, zero to 50 points, you know. So uh, I think that a Spanish lawyer is not qualified to uh, make the translation from the English system of describing injuries into the point system. Article 37.1 of the Act of the Baremo says that a medical report uh, drafted according to the system is essential in order to be able to uh, uh, carry on the proceedings, you know. So in this case, even if the, if the lawyer knows very well how it works, a lawyer should not be qualified to, uh, to translate uh, 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 injuries which are described into points. Next slide, please. Now we're going to talk about temporary injury. Normally we leave that in Spanish system at the end because if you have seen this, this is upside down from your point of view, you know, you see on the wrong side of the road, this one as well, you know. So we're going to start with basic and specific non pecuniary losses in case of temporary injury. As we have said before, temporary inju injuries are those suffered by the victim from the time of the accident until consolidation, and then we come with permanent injuries or uh, uh, until healing, you know, then this, this victim has only per uh, temporary injury. In the case of temporary injury, the temporary injury basically are assessed per diem, you know, a certain amount per diem. You have what we call basic non pecuniary laws, which established, established according to a fixed amount per diem of 31.32 euros. Uh, why 31.32? Because this system is updated every year. It started being 30 uh, euros, you know, and with inflation, uh, the, the, the direction of the insurance makes uh, issues every year and an update, you know, and this is the, the 2020 uh, uh, price for uh, basic non pecuniary loss. Then we have specific non pecuniary loss, losses, and these are uh, a mean. Uh, what we'll see later on is uh, quality of life. The idea of quality of life is how the injury affects you in your daily life, uh, uh, in your uh, uh, mobility, in your relation with the others, in the practice of your sports, in everything, you know. So in this case, uh, uh, temporary loss of quality uh, life, uh, it's uh, divided in three degrees. The first degree is very severe temporary loss of quality of life. That is gives uh, today an amount of 104 euros uh, per day, uh, 40, with 42 cents, you know. Uh, then a severe loss of quality of life with a, a lower quantity and a moderate uh, loss of uh, uh, quality of life. Just if the victim cannot work, if the victim, for instance, cannot work, it's immediately a moderate. But if the victim has a, 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 a more serious impairment, it would not be moderate. It would be according to the serious impairment. The, the Act uses examples, examples to bridge the gap between the old system and the new system, but these are just examples. So, for instance, 
someone who spends uh, one day in an in intensive care unit, this is no doubt a very severe lo temporary loss of quality of life. But if this person is at home uh, 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 with tubes into his mouth and tied to a bed, he's not in an uh, intensive care unit, but this is a still a very severe. So the idea of very intensive care unit or day at hospital are just examples of the situations. What it's important to decide the degree is the impairment that you have in your in your in your uh, uh, personal life. You know, then at the end we have uh, specific non pecuniary losses which are losses caused by surger surgery. Uh, sometimes people are spent very few days at hospital, but in very few days they have several operations, you know. So the idea was also to compensate for the for these operations, uh, depending on the type of uh, surgical procedure in the type on, of anesthesia. And this is something that must be also assessed by, a, by a, a, a medical doctor, by a physician, you know, because he's an expert on the system. Next slide, please. Uh, I think I this is where, on. yeah, yeah, I think this is where I jump in and we, we go back to our uh, case law of uh, Rachel. So let's um, apply everything that Mikel has just told us about the new Boremo and let's assume that our medical expert, whichever expert we choose to use, has determined that from the date of the accident to the date of consolidation of the injuries, which we understand as a date of discharge from the neuro rehab unit, so that's the 8th of October 2019, more or less 18 months, that Rachel has had 107 days of very severe on we grave temporary loss of life. So if you have a look at the uh, ready slide, uh, red arrow here on the slide, you'll see that's 107 days um, attracting an amount of 104 euros per day. So that gives us a total of about 11,172 euros. Then let's assume that there are 838 days of severe or grave loss of quality of life. So if you look at the orange uh, arrow here, that's 838 days at 78.31 um, uh, euros. So that gives us 65,600 euros roughly. So that will give us a total for temporary loss of quality of life of around 76,700 euros. Now let's also assume that uh, Rachel had five minor operations. So each attracting the minimum sum under this head of 417 euros 66. So five um, of those operations at 417 euros gives us around 2,088, uh, sorry, 2,088 euros, which you can see here in green. So that gives us a total specific non-pecuniary loss of about 78,885 in, in Rachel's case. So um, let's, let's move on um, to the next, um, the next slide, Mikel, and in this slide we are going to look at pecuniary losses for temporary injuries. Well, now, Mikel, what, what can you, what can, pecuniary loss? What can you tell us about this, Mikel? All right. So first is the healthcare expenses up to consolidation. Normally, in many cases, prosthetics or technical aids will be needed for the rest of the of the life of the person. You know, these are normally uh, uh, we'll see later on that these are uh, under temp uh, permanent injuries as well. You know, but in uh, all healthcare expenses include everything. In this case, prosthetics, orthotics, technical aids, uh, support products for personal autonomy, and uh, that should be recoverable. Then there is a new head of loss, which is, I think it's very interesting and gives a lot of flexibility, which is called miscellaneous recoverable expenses. We are talking all the time up to consolidations because we're dealing with uh, temporary injuries, you know. And the basic idea is that these miscellaneous recovery expenses, as long as they are justified and as long as they are reasonable, they should be recoverable. You know, so they include, for instance, the increased mobility costs during this time, 
the victim must make taxes, but not just the victim, the family members must visit the victim at the hospital. The, mass, the family members must spend hours uh, with the victim, you know, uh, and, and, and probably they have to, uh, to, uh, to have a meal or to, uh, to take a hotel. All these expenses should be recoverable under this head of laws. Of course, there is a, a normal, a very strong reaction against it of the insurers, you know, because they fear that this, this new head of laws will expand a lot. But the idea is to cover uh, all the things, including the, the cost of temporary care of the victim and temporary care of the children. Normally, normally, and this can be cannot be clearly read in the act, but I think it's it's not an unfair interpretation. Uh, if you are a, temp a victim and you bring an invoice that you have paid someone to take care of you during this time, that would be recoverable. But if it's a family member, you know, it's not very clear from the act whether this is recoverable or not. You know, I think it should be recoverable. You know, because friends, relatives uh, are solidary with their family members, with their friends, not with insurers. They are not there to reduce the insurance cost, you know. But anyway, this is something that is not very clear and probably in most cases would not be acceptable to pay uh, this uh, uh, work that has been done pro bono uh, by someone to help a family member. Uh, next slide, please. Well, in the case of uh, uh, permanent injury, we have uh, what is called, uh, remember the table we had at the beginning, the basic non-pecuniary loss. The basic non-pecuniary loss are the non-pecuniary losses that you suffer from your uh, uh, injuries, you know, from the sequela. And first, there is a, a medical baremo, it's a table that lists all the possible uh, injuries that you may have, describes them and assigns a point or a bracket of points. Normally, in order to avoid confusion, each of these injuries has a code. This is very new. Normally, even, even medical doctors, as per medical doctors, are not very used to use this code. But this code should be promoted because if not, we, we don't know what we're talking about, you know. So each injury has a code and has a certain number of points or a range of points. Here, for instance, where you see on the on the left side of this table, on the sorry, on the right side of the table, there is a, a, an arrow, a green arrow, that uh, shows that a certain uh, injury is uh, the bracket is between 21 and 50 points. You know, so the bracket is quite wide. You know. And, 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 and it must be a medical expert who can assess more or less whether it's 21 or 23 or 40, you know. In most of the cases, the bracket is not that wide, you know. So we have uh, uh, normally in this, in this medical baremo, uh, the list of psychophysical injuries, and then at the end, uh, which can go up to 100 points, and at the end, the aesthetic damage. The aesthetic damage is the a small table you see uh, done with the yellow arrow that says that the, the static damage can reach up to 50 points. In this case, the yellow arrow is pointing to a, a very important static damage that is between 31 and 40 points, you know. So the idea is that both heads of loss are assessed separately and uh, at the end the amounts are added, you know. So another thing, don't add the points. I mean, if you have, for instance, seven, uh, seven or, or different injuries, don't add the points because there is a formula there that probably later on someone is going to talk about that, that it's very complicated, you know. And the points from aesthetic and psychophysical injury are not added, are the amounts that are added at the end, right? Uh, next okay. slide, please. So Jennifer. thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for that, Mikel. Um, Gigi, I'm going to annoy you and just ask you to go back to the last slide, um, if if you may. So I just want to take us back to our case study of Sarah and Rachel, because we know that Rachel sustained a serious head injury, but not the most serious. Um, so the reason we've got this green arrow on here to the right 
is so this is under the uh, description of SQL for uh, head injuries. So let's assume that she's allocated the top end of um, this uh, section, allowing her 50 points for the head injury in SQL. And let's also assume that she's allocated 37 points for the aesthetic injuries, which we can see falls into, as Mikel said, the we importante section of um, the uh, aesthetic injury section. So if you then take those individual amounts, we need to, as Mikhail said, not add them together, but assess those heads of loss separately. And if you could move on to the next slide, we'll show you how that is done. Thanks very much. So on here, uh, you can see that at the top, across the top, um, there are the different ages of the victim. Um, so these uh, tables go on for reams and reams and reams covering all ages. Um, so we know that Rachel is uh, 36, so you can see the red arrow at the top. Now, looking at the damages for the head injury, if you move over to the far left hand um, column, this is where the points are. So if you go to the orange uh, arrow, you can see that there are 50 points uh, here. If you move that along to the age column of 36, that takes us to the green arrow. And you can see for the psychophysical damage, there will be a total of around 103,231 euros. But you won't be able to see this, I don't think, on the slide that this up on the screen. It might be a bit small, um, but you will see these on the slides that are sent around after. Um, now, moving on to aesthetic damage, again, if you go along the far left hand column, you can go to the 37 points, which is shown there in blue, and then follow that across to the age column of 36. And that gives us aesthetic damages amount of £65,261, uh, euro, sorry, which is shown in the, uh, by the purple, by the purple uh, arrow. So that gives a total for uh, this basic non-pecuniary loss of 168,000 uh, euros or just over. So, Mikhail, what can you tell us about the other damage for permanent injuries in SQL I under Spanish law? Um, Gigi, would you move on to the next slide, please? Thank you, Jennifer. Well, what we have seen were the basic non-pecuniary losses. Now uh, we're going to go through these, the so-called specific non-pecuniary losses, which are losses that uh, uh, are added, uh, it's amounts that are added according to a specific situations of the of the victim. Uh, the first uh, case is what is called uh, complementary moral damage for psychophysical injury, which applies in cases of uh, psychophysical injury uh, over over 60 points when there is only one injury, or over 80 points when there is a, a, a plurality of injuries. And aesthetic damage, if the, uh, the aesthetic damage reaches at least 36 points. So if we have an aesthetic damage of 37 points, then we could apply these amounts that uh, are in a, in a, in a range, uh, a quite wide range. Then an important, and this is a new head of loss, uh, uh, called loss of quality of life. Loss of quality of lives can depend on what is called loss of personal autonomy. The, the, the act at the beginning uh, describes what is loss of personal autonomy, uh, uh, which is something similar to the grand invalido, but not exactly the same. The, the you cannot do many, many uh, things that you would do in your ordinary life, like getting up, dressing, sitting, eating by yourself and so on. Then we have what is called loss of personal development. You cannot practice exports, you cannot uh, uh, have some activities. And uh, then you have also uh, the loss of quality life can, can have its origin in that you cannot carry out your job or profession. You know, I mean, working is a, a very important part of the personal development. And uh, the act thought that it was uh, very, uh, very important to highlight it, you know. So in these cases, no matter what is the origin, uh, we have several degrees, which is a very severe degree, severe degree, moderate degree and slight. In the recent uh, exposed assessment that we conducted, we found out that over the last three years, only 0.3% of the accidents led to very severe degree loss of quality of life. Whereas severe, severe degree of quality of life was 3.35, moderate 15% and a slight 
loss of quality of life was 80% of the cases. So as, 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 as we can see, uh, you know, fortunately, uh, most people have small accidents, don't, don't, don't have very serious accidents, you know. Something that it must be stressed is that in order to be com compensable, in order to be recoverable, the head of loss of a slight degree requires a minimum of six points which to me it's nonsense because you have you can have uh, 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 some sort of loss of quality of life uh, you cannot play the piano imagine you are an amateur player and uh, you have an accident and that that you will not be able to play the piano in your life and probably it's very few points of physical injury but it affects your development you know but anyway insurers wanted to make sure that that that, that, that will be amended in the near future probably but uh, uh, in order to qualify for, for a slight uh, degree of loss of quality of life, you need at least uh, uh, a minimum of, of uh, six points or seven points. I don't remember. So I think I think I think less than seven points. You don't qualify. Uh, also, it's very important. We have another another uh, head of loss, which is loss of quality of life of a relative of seriously injured victims. In this case, it's not the family members or the relatives who are taking care of the person, because that that is another head of loss and it's normally pecuniary loss, and it uh, we'll see later on. But it's the disruption that the the severe uh, situation of the injury of a relative causes in the life of this person. You know, uh, in this case, normally, in order to qualify for this head of loss, the, the victim, the primary victim, must have at least 80 points of, of, uh, of uh, psychophysical injury. But uh, the law opens it a little bit up here, you know, and uh, it could be also uh, it could be also proven that in spite that the 80 points have not been reached, uh, uh, this, this head of loss uh, would apply. Let, then we have a loss of fetus as a result of the accident, and which is very, very rare. We have had very few cases in Spain. And, and then uh, there is what is called an exceptional non pecuniary loss. This exceptional non pecuniary loss is defined in the law as the relevant losses resulting from singular circumstances and not include in the Baremo system. This exceptional uh, head of loss would allow an increase of a maximum of 25% of the basic non pecuniary loss that we have seen in previous slides, you know. Uh, but this loss, as we uh, we say, is just a non pecuniary loss. We, we will not find a parallel loss in the in pecuniary loss. We don't find a parallel in temporary injuries, you know. So it's uh, it's only very exceptional cases, you know. Next slide, please. So Gigi, it's, uh, I'll take it from here. So thank, thank you for that, Mikel. And um, the, the section about the um, exceptional loss is really interesting because it seems at least there is some sort of uh, corrective factor there for the non-pecuniary losses to make sure that any gaps are picked up. But anyway, now, okay, so let's, let's go back to our case study of uh, Rachel and Sarah and their family. Um, and let's assume that, she's in, that Rachel is entitled to the following heads of uh, special non-pecuniary loss. Um, so there's special general damages, if you like. So let's look at, first of all, the complementary moral damages for the psychophysical injury. And let's assume that she has at least the 80 points. And this, this is the magical 80 points that Mikel kept referring to. Mikel mentioned earlier about um, a formula to apply, and it's, it's known as a reduction formula or the Balthazar formula, and it's, it's provided for in Article 19, uh, 98 of the, of the 2015 Act. Um, now, the explanation of how the Balthazar formula works, it requires a webinar of its own, and I appreciate that I am talking about having a lot of future webinars here, so let's see. Um, but for those of you who are interested, that formula is set out at the foot of this page, and I'm not going to go into that now. But anyway, let's just assume that Rachel has attracted 80 points under the Balthazar formula. Um, so if you look at the red arrow, we can see that she would be entitled to damages of anywhere between 20,000 and around 100,000 uh, for moral damages, the complementary moral damages for the psychophysical injury. 
So then let's look at complementary moral damages for the aesthetic injury. Now, we know that she had 37 points for this, so we know she's above the minimum threshold of 36 points, which is required here. So you can see this here at the orange arrow. So we know she'd be entitled to anywhere between 10,000 euros and around 50,000 euros. Um, now, in respect of the loss of quality of life, which is shown here in yellow, let's assume she falls into the upper end of the severe or the grave bracket. That bracket would attract damages of anywhere between 41,700 and 104,400 euros. Um, so let's assume she would attract somewhere in the region of 100,000 euros because she's at the upper end of that bracket. Now, we also know that Rachel, in our case study, will be entitled to damages for the loss of fetus as a consequence of the accident. And she would fall into the second of the two uh, categories because we know she was 30, 30 weeks pregnant at the time. So if you look at the arrow shown in blue here, and I appreciate I'm skipping down a bit, um, that she would get damages of €31,300 for this. Now, this new head of loss about the non-pecuniary moral damages for the family's uh, loss of quality of life. It's an interesting distinction that Mikel made because obviously he's talked about the costs which are recoverable for the care that um, the family provide. And that's something that is quite separate. That's an economic, a financial claim that would be made separately. Um, but here, this is the general damages claim, it's sometimes referred to as a ricochet claims in other European jurisdictions. But this is the um, moral damages claim for the family's loss of quality of life. And if you look at the green arrow, you can see that they would be the family would be entitled to anywhere between 31,300 euros and around 151,400 euros. Um, so that that brings us up to speed uh, with the case study. So if we now look um, and Mikel is going to take us there. Mikel, what can you tell us about the economic damages which are allowed under the new Barema for permanent injuries and equal eye under Spanish law? Uh, Gigi, would you take us to the next slide, please? Thank you, Jennifer. Well, uh, and thank you, Gigi. Uh, uh, now uh, we are going to enter the pecuniary losses and we'll uh, talk first about expenses. And one of the, the main expenses is foreseeable future healthcare costs. Uh, remember something that it was not payable under the over ever. What, what has been done with anyone? Uh, the victim does not get uh, these amounts. This head of loss uh, is not money for the for the victim, so to say. You know, so uh, the idea is that uh, the the foreseeable future health costs are established in the act according to my liking to a too complicated system, and uh, the, the the result are a, a certain number of amounts, and these amounts are paid directly to the Spanish national healthcare systems who commits itself to provide a healthcare to the victim for the rest of his or her life. So insurers pay directly to the social security, to the national health care system uh, for, this, uh, for this amount. And normally they do it through agreements where they can reach very good prices, you know. So uh, uh, looking at the, the, the cost of uh, of uh, uh, healthcare uh, cost of this uh, future uh, uh, future um, need to, to provide this health cost uh, is not a, a market cost. Is something that is there because of the agreements that they normally have. Then the victim, what the victim gets are the prosthesis. You know, and the old system, the victim got only one prosthesis for the, the rest of his or her life. You know, but now the new one has introduced. Uh, replacements. So there is also table at the end that uh, uh, processes are uh, have a, a, a life of six, seven ever, uh, years, and you know, and then after a certain amount of time, they should be replaced. So the new system uh, pays a maximum around fifty thousand euros for each replacement. Uh, of course, each replacement can be uh, uh, collected, can be paid in a lump sum, and there is a table that will transform these uh, these uh, different replacements in a, in a lump sum. I regard home and hospital rehabilitation services. Uh, there are also caps depending on the type of injury, uh, but they are paid to the victim. 
and uh, the expenses resulting from the loss of personal autonomy, which in the past most of them were uh, limited to the Gran Invalid or to the very seriously uh, injured person. They are not anymore. They, are, they, are, they have some restrictions, but generally they are not anymore. Uh, we have among these uh, uh, expenses resulting from loss of personal autonomy, technical appliances and products of support, uh, adaptation of housing, Increase of mobility cost. This increase of mobility cost in the past was the adaptation of the car. Now, uh, uh, in the system, uh, the new system, the new Baremo establishes that, uh, well, the victim, what the victim suffers is a mobility cost, a loss of uh, a loss of mobility. The victim uh, cannot drive or cannot uh, uh, take a bus anymore and must, must take a taxi. Uh, and, and then we have third party support costs. I'm going to talk a little bit more about it, you know. So uh, notice that all these uh, expenses are capped. They have a cap. Uh, to me, this is uh, this is wrong. And, I, and, uh, and uh, the ex post uh, assessment that we have made, there is a, a recommendation to uh, do away with these caps, but probably no, 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 no luck to succeed in the future. Uh, because uh, these caps uh, contradict uh, full compensation. Now, probably they could be enough in many situations, but what happens if they are not? You know, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, in these uh, expenses resulting uh, resulting from loss of personal autonomy mainly the third party support cost. Uh, in this case, uh, normally uh, people get third party support costs, generally in case of very severe or very severe loss of quality of life. Uh, and, and there is a very complicated system that establishes double limitation. The first limitation is that it assesses a certain number of hours and a certain number of hours, the maximum is 16 hours that you can get support. Why 16 hours? Well, we, because the a medical committee decided that 16 hours was enough, you know. Well, uh, the second limitation is the amount that is paid for hour, you know, and the amount that is paid for hour is based on the uh, uh, salary, uh, the, the, the general salary, and uh, this amount is uh, quite low. You know, it's about uh, eight, nine euros per hour uh, without distinguishing between night hours, day hours or weekends, you know. So still, this is very good because in the old Baremo, uh, there was there were not criteria to adapt the third party support. And the only thing that we had in the old Baremo was a lump sum of a maximum 380,000 euros. With a new system, in the most serious cases, victims could get for this head of loss, I think, up to 1.5 million euros, which is not on the same level in that uh, that what happens in most European countries. But for Spain, is quite a progress from a, from a, from a top level of 380,000 euros up to 1.5 million. It's a, it's quite an improvement. So. Um. Yes, you have the floor. Yeah, so I was going to say, I mean, I'm, I'm mindful of a, of a time uh, that we're kind of at the hour now. Um, we only have a couple of slides left. So what we'll do is we'll very quickly go through uh, the loss of earnings, which we know is particularly strict under the Bremo. And then after that, what we're going to do is we're going to come on to, um, as Mikel has said, um, this conflict between the caps uh, which technically exist under the Bremo and this under this overriding principle of con compensation of the Spanish law which is restitute and integrum the principle of full compensation so we'll come on to that at the end but let's go on to the next slide and let's have a, a chat about the loss of earnings which as I said we know was particularly strict under the old Bremo so if Mikel you want to take us through Thank the loss you. of earnings you, yes well in, in the case of, of loss of earnings we have different situations. The first situation is a person who gets income from personal work. And the, 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 the basis of the system is someone who is working for someone else uh, uh, and uh, is getting a salary, so to say, a wage. You know, then uh, we the system starts with a multiplicand for victims that have income from personal work. And the basis of this calculation of the multiplicand is the net income obtained 
uh, by the victim the year before the accident or the three years before, whichever better, you know, because sometimes people don't uh, get the same amount of money every year, you know. And in these cases, we have uh, three different situations. The first situation would be where the victim has suffered such an injury that she will not be able to work at all for the rest of her life. In this case, we have what we call uh, absolute disability, which means 100% of loss of earnings and the multiple it should be 100% uh, of the net income that, that has been lost. Then we have a, a, a second situation which is called total disability. It means that the victim cannot work any longer in her job or profession, but she could work or he could work in other jobs, in other professions, you know. In this case, uh, uh, the victim uh, in the calculations, uh, uh, the base would be 55% of the of the uh, net income if this victim is under 55 and 75% if uh, his uh, victim is 55 or over 55. The idea is that after 55, it's very difficult that you uh, do a different job that you have done in your life. And what is more difficult is that someone uh, gives you that job, someone contracts you for something that you just have learned, you know. Then we can have a, a case of per partial disability. And in this case, it would be 33% uh, of, the, of the net income. And then what is what we could call the serious decline in job performance. Uh, a serious decline would be a decline of 35% or more of the capacity. And in this case, the victim would be entitled for two annual wages. What happens with housekeeper? Housekeepers, people, uh, men or women, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, of course, but normally in the practice, uh, even in Spain now, today, there are more women who are doing housekeeping uh, that uh, don't have any income, but they do a job that has an economic value. And that was the idea, you know. I mean, if you do a job for your family that has an economic value and you uh, keep your house, uh, if you cannot do it any longer, that should be compensated, you know. And well, the, 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 uh, that was very difficult to, to get it across the, the, the insurers. Uh, uh, they have been very suspicious all the time. And uh, now this expose assessment shows, shows us that nothing has happened. It was not the end of the world as they expected at the beginning. And I think this is a head of loss that will be is established now and will be very established in the future without much contestation. Which are the basis for to calculate the multiplicand for housekeeper? Uh, the same in the case of fatal injuries. You know, it's uh, one uh, uh, minimum salary uh, with an increase of 10% for each depending uh, member of the household who are children, disabled persons, old persons. I mean, persons over 67 who mean. Uh, theoretically, an increase of the job of the housekeeper, you know, so the, the multiplicand can be from one minimum salary up to 1.5 minimum salary. The minimum salary now is 950 euros per month multiplied by 14 months, you know, so it would be uh, around 15,000 euros a year. Uh, if the victim had a part-time job, the victim also qualifies to get uh, 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 this loss of, of uh, oh, no, loss of uh, the possibility to keep the house part time. You know, in this case, uh, there are there are no other orientations. The calculation is done as if she were full time housekeeper, and uh, if the victim has a part time job, then she will get one third of what corresponds to a full time housekeeper. So in this case, the victim will have a loss of earnings for the partial work and also a, a, a partial housekeeping and uh, these sums will be will will be compensated. So uh, next slide, please. Also, a new a new case is what happened with children what happens with the students, with people who have not entered yet the labor market, you know? Uh, well, uh, that was a highly disputed, you know? It, it is not, did not exist in the old system. Say, well, this person did not have any loss of earnings. No, no, but my insistence all the time say, well, this person will have a loss of earnings because he's a child who has suffered a terrible accident and he or she will not be able to work for the rest of his life, you know? Oh, no loss of earnings, no. I mean, that was, uh, 
outrageous, you know. And finally, it was accepted that uh, this person should be also entitled uh, to uh, a compensation for future loss of earnings that they will never earn. Uh, what is the system? The system is quite timid, I would say, you know, but it's just a further step, I said. In the case of absolute disability, it means that the child will not be able to work in anything for the rest of her life, then the multiplicand is 1.5 SME, you know, 1.5 this minimum salary. If the child has total disability, is 0.8 minimum salary. Well, how you calculate the total disability of a child? Because a child, a child has, has not a usual job. Well, in this case, you see, well, that the child would be disabled to perform a, a large amount of jobs, you know, and that, but not all of them. In this case, would be total disability. Calculation starts at the age of 30. Why? Well, in the whole system, the age of 30 is the mythical age because normally uh, children are children until 30 in Spain. They stay at home. They don't have an independent life until they are 30, 31. So this is the basis of the system. So you would start calculating that this future loss of earning starts when the student, when the child reaches the age of 30. Uh, there is a possibility of increase of that. Well, we were discussing, the Commission was discussing uh, how could we increase that. Uh, some people said, well, if the parents are, uh, are uh, earn a lot of money because they are high skilled professionals, the child will also be. If, par if parents are non-skilled professionals and they don't earn any money, the child will also be. Well, that was not acceptable. And the only uh, parameter that seemed acceptable was the educational level. So the educational level uh, uh, means that uh, if the child had or was just about attaining or just, or just was just on the way to get a high educational level, in this case, these amounts could be increased, uh, but by 20%. Uh, 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 Let's see in the next slide uh, the multipliers. Next slide, please. In the case of loss of earnings, when once we have the multiplicand, then we should uh, uh, see uh, in order in order to understand how the tables are, are made. And I would make a parenthesis now and say, well, uh, uh, a lawyer must not uh, uh, do all these calculations because these calculations are in the tables. You know, this is just explanation of how the tables have been built. You know, because in these cases you would go to the tables and you would find the amounts there. You know. But the multiplier is the actual actual figure which combines several elements. One element is public pensions. Public pensions or any payments, any collateral payments are deduced. So public pensions for absolute capacity or total or, uh, or, or partial or permanent disability to which the victim are entitled are already deduced in the system. So when you look at the tables, the deduction is already there. There are estimated pensions, the pensions that a normal worker would get in Spain, but the system, so to say, has opened a window here because we have a group of workers who don't follow the general system, a, a group of, uh, of autonomy, what we call the, the autonomy, autonomous workers, the, the uh, independent workers, that they must not pay a certain quantity to Social Security for, uh, for, uh, uh, for public pensions. And in this case, in this case, it could be different. A second one is the duration of the injury. Uh, in case of absolute and total disability, uh, the calculation ends at the age of 67, which is the age of retirement. In the case of partial uh, disability, is two years. Another element in the calculation is life expect expectancy. You know, life expectancy is embedded in the actual tables. And uh, there are two tables, basically, according to the degree of disability. Because people who suffer very severe disability, they have a shorter life expect expect uh, expectancy. And there is a table uh, for people who suffer big disabilities and people who uh, don't suffer these, uh, these serious injuries uh, follow another life expectancy table. And then in the calculations is only the discount rate. The discount rate is 3.5, which takes into account inflation. Uh, 
uh, even for a Spanish stud, uh, uh, now it has been considered that it's too high. And for the next actual tables, it will be reduced to 2.5, you know. So more or less, these are all the things that we should uh, explain rapidly about loss of earnings. Next slide, please. So uh, thank you very much for that, Mikkel. Um, I am very mindful of the time. So I think what we'll do is we'll have to uh, have a final question here that I'll hand over to uh, Mikkel for and then we'll wrap up. Um, but a lot of what Mikkel has told us very much shows us that the Baremo is based upon uh, a Spanish system. It's Spanish centric. It, it applies to victims who live in Spain post accident. Um, it doesn't really work very well for foreign victims who have to return to another country. Now, very helpfully, and we haven't had time to cover this, we do know that the Boremo, it would allow someone who sustained loss of earnings to effectively obtain their report uh, with actual area, uh, actual area, actual aerial evidence, actuarial evidence, we'll get there eventually, um, to be able to show what their actual loss of earnings were, which they could use. And we could similarly say that that could be obtained um, in respect of the care and assistance which is provided. Um, but we do know that there are substantial shortcomings um, in the Baremo system because of how Spanish centric it is. Um, Mikel, can you round up today by telling us a little bit about these shortcomings and what the next steps are? Well, uh, uh, more or less, the, the first the first point is that the for, for the first time, uh, uh, the new Baremo, uh, by contrast to the old one, is uh, uh, drafted with all the stakeholders sitting at the same table. You know, this is positive, uh, and this is also negative. You know, because you cannot uh, uh, go as far as you would like to go, uh, and the uh, uh, new Baremo is based on a consensus. Uh, Th things that show like that, you know, for instance, all these caps that we have in case of uh, uh, expenses, you know, uh, of future expenses, you know, well, all these caps, I mean, should not be there because there are caps for uh, for pecuniary losses. And so they, they should be assessed uh, uh, even, even in abstract according to other parameters, you know, but what happens? Uh, well, insurers want to know that there is a maximum, but also victims, the representative of victims want to know that is a maximum because insurers cannot go lower than that maximum, you know. So this is based on the way that uh, uh, big associations of victims as insurers have been, have been working in Spain, you know. Uh, so uh, there are other things that, for instance, the Baremo uh, plays, uh, pays what I would call a lip service to the, to the principle of full reparation. Uh, uh, there is an article which is center article of the Baremo uh, where there is a sort of contradiction between the idea of assessing the amounts and limiting the amounts. So the whole Baremo, there is always this two point of view conflicting up and now. And uh, although I insist it's a, a very uh, a very important improvement for Spanish victims, you know, uh, it's, it shows all the time this, uh, this uh, conflicting thing. If you go, for instance, to Article 33, which uh, of the Baremo system, which talks about the fundamental principles of the valuation system, and it says the fundamental principles are the principles of full compensation and separate compensation, separate compensations, it means that pecuniary, non-pecuniary losses should not be merged. That's happened with your one, because if you merge, and merge them, you don't know what you are compensating for. And then all these two principles uh, uh, should be, uh, uh, are two fundamental principles in order to objectify the assessment. The idea of objectify the assessment is the insurance idea, you know, that we have an assessment that we know all the time what are the maximums that we should pay, you know. And, and, and then there is a conflict in there, you know. So uh, the, going further to this provision says the principle of full compensation is intended to grant full indemnity for the damage suffered. All right, that's wonderful. But then it says the compensation in the system takes into account any personal, family, social and economic circumstances of the victim. Well, takes into account these this, this situations in abstract, not uh, each, each victim. You know, and if it when it takes into account these situations, 
the uh, uh, family, social and economic circumstances. Of course, it cannot take into account the, the, the situations of all victims of the world. It takes the situation of the Spanish victims, you know. And what I say is that sometimes that cannot adapt to the situation in different countries, you know. For instance, the cap that we said before for uh, imp improvements in your in your home uh, when you need uh, to do some uh, repairs or you need to 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 do some work in order to adapt the home to the to the civilly injured person, you know. Well, in this case, there is a cap of around 150,000 euros. Well, uh, even in Spain, if you live in a, in a small village, that, is, uh, uh, that can be enough. But if, if you live in a big village, uh, well, probably you will not have enough. But the cap is the cap and that's it, you know. So uh, we have uh, things like that. And uh, I know that with the old Baremo, uh, there have been that some decisions that have uh, even decided to disapply the baremo. You know, uh, I think I recall an Italian decision. Probably Jennifer, you could tell us a little bit more about this decision. Uh, and it's a decision that has disapplied the old baremo, but uh, the reasons for disapplying the old baremo would be the same for the new one, yeah. although yeah. the heads of laws of difference. Yeah, that's right. Um, so this was an old Bremo case. Um, the Italian courts disapplied that case and it was a final ruling in 2019. Um, so that arose from a road traffic accident in Spain involving two twin sisters who were passengers. So one of them died and sadly the other suffered personal injury. And the old Bremo didn't con compensate them for, uh, didn't compensate siblings at that time for bereavement or for the deeper suffering of the surviving twin on the grounds of their close relationship. Now, I think this gap has been rectified in the new Bremo, but the key point here was that the Italian court considered that under Rome 2, it was able to disapply the Bremo whenever applying it would leave a compensatory gap. And because we know that Article 26 of Rome 2 effectively provides that um, the application of a provision of law of any country specified by the regulation may be refused only if such application is manifestly incompatible with a public policy of a forum. So effectively, it was, it was a public policy um, sort of argument. And it, it is worth noting, certainly from a Spanish law perspective, but there is no reported case law of which I'm aware of or of which um, Yacal is aware, uh, which states that the Barema must be, must be applied to victims of accident. Um, accidents outside of uh, Spain. But I think on that note, we we probably uh, need to uh, round up given the time. So if I could ask you, Gigi, to move forward two slides, please. That's the one. So just to round up, I wanted to thank you all very much for joining us in virtual Spain. An extra special thank you to Gemma uh, who's been here today. Gigi, who's behind the scenes, moving our slides along, and you'll hear her name mentioned throughout the, book, uh, throughout the webinar. But most of all, to Mikel for agreeing to speak in English, first of all, because we appreciate how difficult uh, that is speaking on a webinar when it's not your first language, but also to step away from his very busy life, drafting legislation and teaching the next generation of Spanish lawyers. So thank you very much um, for that. And if we haven't had time to answer your queries, we have tried to answer a few as we've gone along, then please do complete the feedback link uh, leave your name and address, um, your, your email address, sorry, and we can try to follow up with you. Um, we'll shortly be virtually tracking to a different country in Europe, so we really do hope we can see you there. Um, so just moving on, if you want to contact us at all, onto the next slide. Uh, Gemma and uh, my contact details are on there. Um, and then the final slide, um, sorry, Gigi, <laughs> and then moving on to the next slide. Um, I'll draw your attention to this. This is all of our Mitchell's details. It sets out for full range of services that we offer. So do do have a look at that. Uh, but thank you all again for attending and uh, goodbye. <laughs>